morning. My name is Andre Rue from the Institute for Futures Research and Stellenbosch University Business School. I've just given a brief overview of a book edited by Moletzi and Becky entitled Advocates for Change, How Africa uh, Can Overcome Its Challenges. This is a follow-up of a previous book which diagnosed Africa's problems. This one, a collection of essays that offers solutions to many of Africa's problems. The major thrust of the book turns out to be that governance is one of the most crucial prerequisites for possible success. An edited version of this book review uh, follows. Good morning to all of you, so early in the morning. Uh, as will have been pointed out there, a few years ago we looked at one of Moletti and Baker's earlier books, uh, Architects of Poverty. In this book he goes a step further, Advocates for Change, and puts forward a set of policy prescriptions. He has approached a number of well-known researchers and experts in their fields to cover quite a wide range and quite a diverse range of issues in this book. The first one, negative trends in the South African economy, how should these be overcome? Since 1995-96, economic growth here has not been all that bad, especially compared to the previous 20 or 30 years. Mohammed, to a large extent, disagrees. He puts together this rather interesting graph. The red bar shows us, as you can see since 1990, the total credit extended to the private sector as a percentage of the entire economy. And the blue one down here shows us actual fixed capital formation, investment, the kind of stuff that we really need to grow an economy. He makes the point a huge amount of credit, the red bar has been extended to the private sector, not much has been used to finance investment, only the blue area. So what's happened to the rest, he asks. So in answering the question what's happened to all this debt, most of it has been used to finance household spending. And these kind of arguments paved the way for his argument that post-apartheid economic policies have not really addressed the structural weaknesses of the economy. So, what's the solution that Muhammad offers? <coughs> Focus on supporting industrial development and employment creation. Make the economy less dependent on the mining and minerals processing. Shift the growth path away from debt consumption and speculation and, and try to become really competitive trying to become productive uh, in the industrial sector. Reform the financial system to make institutions more responsive to the needs of the industry. And then and perhaps one of the most controversial statements offered by this author, the very last uh, paragraph in fact, ensure that economic rents, particularly of the mining sectors and the monopoly sectors, should be managed by the state to support their economic and industrial policy goals. Part of, as we all know, Africa's biggest blessings and also perhaps biggest curse is our ongoing reliance on natural resources. Africa's mineral resources, what must be done to make them drivers of development? Going back, as you can see, to the early 1900s, it is, if you like, a basket of natural resources, of commodities, and we measure the price of the basket and discover that the price of that basket peaked just before the First World War. And then for the next roughly one century, or 90 years, the price generally moved downwards. But interestingly, within 10 years, that collapse in prices was restored with even a bit more. How do we translate the current commodity boom into growth and development? Resource rents can be defined as returns in excess of the expected or average return on capital. The suggestion is, use these let's call it excessive returns, to improve the basic physical and knowledge infrastructure of the nation, to start developing agriculture, forestry, tourism. It's about downstream value addition, upstream value addition, technology and product development. We can use all of this for regional economic integration. One should aim for multi-state cooperation in Africa to establish regional development corridors and very importantly, so as to make available a seamless infrastructure provision. The next author, David Everett, also presents with a rather interesting analysis. It's about, as you can see there, inequality in this country and also class formation. And he ventures to ask what that's going to mean for future voting patterns in this country. 
the people surveyed were asked to describe themselves, to describe how they perceive themselves when it comes to class. As you can see, roughly 2% classified themselves as upper class, about 26% middle class, about 30% working class, about 38% poor, and the others uh, said something else, or we just don't know, we just don't care. Further analysis shows, not all that surprisingly, that race was correlated with class labeling. So 46% of Africans said they were poor, only 4.4% of whites. Also, not surprisingly, a strong correlation with education and how you describe your particular class. So, what is Everett's set of conclusions? Post-apartheid class formation, especially the formation of African middle class, remains blur blurry and poorly understood and poorly defined. If the ANC remains heavily pegged to a race or age cohort, the party could hit a ceiling. Cope's implosion gives the ANC a bit more breathing space. Respond, it no doubt will. The challenge has not gone, it has merely been postponed. The education system, how can it be made more productive? We're looking here at the number of people who in those days, 2007, uh, did higher grade maths and uh, attained an A aggregate. That's the number of black uh, learners, one in every 640. Amongst white learners, one in every 11. And that's in one of many ways of describing the still very uh, distinct divide, as it were. Potential matriculants who drop out before writing matric, 82% of those who drop out are amongst our black African uh, young population. Clearly, from that level alone, the education system is failing us. How do we explain this low productivity? He says, we suffer from a lack of what he calls systematic routines and rituals. Little things like being at school on time, not just by the learners, but by the uh, uh, educators as well. The knowledge problem, two, at least two kinds of knowledge problems that, that educators have. The actual content of their subjects and also knowledge of how to teach a particular subject. Too much bureaucratic and administrative ineptitude, lack of accountability and a general lack of capacity and expertise to run a school or to run a schooling system. The final question, of course, is, well, what now? What are we going to do about it? What can be done? He says, restore political authority over schools back where it belongs. The authority belongs with government, not teachers' unions. Uh, Mike Harrington identifies some obstacles and proposes how to possibly overcome these obstacles. He looks at international research on the topic. The percentage of the population, age 18 to 64, that is involved in early stage entrepreneurial activity, in other words, starting a business. Then we find this kind of relationship. And then we superimpose upon that, and South Africa comes in there. Now, if you assume that we should be on the curve, if we were on the curve, implication is that rather than being at barely 5 or 6%, that our entrepreneurial rate should be close to 13% if we were matching or fitting the curve. Why does our early stage entrepreneurial activity lag behind countries at a similar stage of economic development? Education and training, we need to retrain teachers. Uh, and then controversially, and yet not exclusively, he reckons that, you know, you've got to think about good old-fashioned economics, is there's a, if there's a shortage of teachers or educators in some disciplines, pay them a, a premium. Make teaching for maths and science teachers more attractive. Access to finance. It is simply very often too difficult for small business or aspiring small business to gain or to get hold of some startup money. Move away from the sense of entitlement towards empowerment. Well, what makes Africans sick or injures them? But I'm using their own words there. Anything ranging from the failure of health systems, the failure to deliver decent, proper health care, inadequate number of healthcare professionals, and in many cases, healthcare professionals prefer not to work in Africa, but to work beyond Africa's borders. Water is often a problem. Natural and humanitarian disasters, inadequate nutrition, obviously HIV and AIDS, and other infectious diseases, malaria, uh, river swamp fever, denge fever, TB, and the like. 
very often access to affordable and safe medicines is simply not uh, prevalent. <coughs> Pregnancy, violence, especially gender-related, cancers, traffic accidents, cigarettes, and other uh, substance abuse. Look at history as a reason for many of our problems when it comes to health. And we could look at, or we could play the blame game. But when all is said and done, they do point out that many countries with limited resources have nonetheless made rapid strides in addressing these constraints, despite having huge resource constraints. Solutions lie largely with improving the systems, together with mechanisms to address poverty. And then they suggest Africa does have access to the right interventions and the diagnostics and affordable drugs and vaccines to immediately tackle vaccine-preventable diseases and to tackle maternal ill health and TB and malaria and river blindness and the like. So he, they reckon that government should be able to or should filter out the most pressing and relevant messages and then make them more particular, more germane, more relevant for the country that we are talking about. Mauritius, with this author asking the question, why is this island nation a political and economic success? What, it, what has it done to become one of the most successful nations in Africa? And it is quite remarkable if you look at the last 40 years in Mauritius. Back in 1970, it was described all over the world as the overcrowded barracoon. Its problems defy solution. It is plagued by despair. Per capita income, $260. 40 years later, per capita income, $11,400. Highest in Africa, 71st highest in the world. What did they do? They took a pragmatic approach. Namely, first decide what you want to achieve and then determine how you're going to get there. Their decision was they want to achieve the following. Employment for all, a welfare state, sustainable, sustainable growth in national wealth, and equal distribution of wealth. Their words, their slogan was, never kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. So, for instance, when they became independent, the local bourgeoisie, or the landed bourgeoisie, the big sugarcane farmers, were allowed to continue as big sugarcane farmers. They did transfer some of their wealth to the government via export levy, and that compromise seemed to have worked. This gentleman claims that in most parts of Africa, we have a pseudo-democracy. By and large, that democracy has been guided and shaped and molded by international role players. And therefore, he suggests or argues that elections in Africa have been fraudulent and democracies are cheap. Nonetheless, on the more positive side, it has been found that throughout Africa, citizens remain optimistic about the possibility of really building democracies. And the argument is that you cannot have a true democracy unless you have economic development, a sizable working class, and a developed market economy. What then should African societies do, uh, what do they need to embark upon to achieve that desire? Escape from the global system of election financing. Democracy on the cheap is underwritten by donors, and that's at the heart of the faltering participation processes. Recognize the trade-offs between creating functional parties for sustainable democracy versus the inordinate focus on building NGOs. Install the preconditions of democracy, property rights, a thriving middle class, expanding uh, the private sector. And then finally, he says we need to take a closer look at the trade-off between democracy and development. Barely 30% of arable land in Africa is being used as arable land, which implies that we are totally underutilizing our food producing potential in Africa. What are the issues and challenges for agricultural productivity? The diversity of cropping systems, undeveloped markets, minimal mechanization, limited seasonal financing, trying to compete with food aid, the dominance of weathered and inherently infertile soils, weak support systems, poor policies, all of those and perhaps a few more explain why agricultural productivity, especially in the traditional sense of the word, has been woefully inadequate for so many years. So, what to do? We can come up with 
very important and useful and interesting uh, ideas, but none of those ideas will have much meaning unless supported by a political will, by good governance. In many countries, there's the kind of assumption that unregistered land is automatically state, state owned land. Any questions that? There's also an assumption that common land is private land. Any questions that as well? You need to have land tenure and property rights, but they need to be very carefully and precisely laid out. Investing in social and physical capital, improving technology, but at the same time promoting traditional principles of agriculture. Commercialize smallholder agriculture. Develop the value chain. Make trade open and transparent and fair for smallholder farmers. And then obviously, thinking longer term, we have to start thinking about the impact of climate change in all kinds of strategies. The last two are, are similar. Reindustrialization and regional cooperation. In the early years following independence, we found that manufacturing production in Africa grew by a fairly healthy 5.6%. Since then, growth in manufacturing has slowed down to 1.7 and 3.1 respectively. Some arguments put forward for this, individual markets in Africa are too small to really sustain a constantly growing manufacturing sector. Another problem is technological dependency. To really keep up this kind of growth and productivity, you need to be able to get hold of, if you like, uh, the most appropriate technology. And then many would also point out that one of the, some of the reasons for this include the 1980s structural adjustment programs imposed upon Africa, so it is argued, by uh, the World Bank and the IMF. Do we want regional integration in Africa? And if we do, is it plausible? And the point here really is it's not one or the other, or it shouldn't be one or the other. It should be globalized whilst considering and whilst accepting that you also have regionalization. Nonetheless, he says, well, we need to give it a, a very careful thought. And more and more people are saying maybe we shouldn't go for an African Union kind of idea that's perhaps too ambitious, but rather sub-regions. And in essence, this gentleman's saying more or less the same. It leaves us with a similar topic, regional integration, from a different author. First of all, intensify political and, and institutional reform. He reckons empower the African Union. Develop, develop and strengthen national and regional regulatory authorities to facilitate market-driven operations. Facilitate cross-border and FDI in setting up industries that can add value. Capacity building policies. We need a speedy integration, comma, informal and subsistence economy. So it's not just the formal economy, it's also the informal or subsistence economy which should be part of this regionalization. The right kind of education, invest heavily in human capital so that you're able to do the right thing and move beyond just producing natural resources. I want to leave the last word to the editor of this book, Moletzi Mbeki. There is nothing unavoidable about Africa's political instability, about Africa's underperformance, about Africa's falling health and educational standards, about Africa's inability to advance regional integration and to raise the productivity of small-scale agricultural systems. People, he argues, in Africa have had enough of the arrogance, the corruption, the ineptitude and incompetence of Africa's ruling elites. And he suggests that this country's government has, has become complacent and that they are saying to themselves, as many others are, we don't have to worry about an Arab Spring. So, don't worry. And Becky says, maybe we do need to worry. The common message does seem to be implied over here, and that is over and above each issue in each country's unique idiosyncrasies uh, underlying any kind of success is, will always be good governance, uh, goodwill, political aptitude, bureaucratic aptitude, not ineptitude, aptitude. And without those things, the best laid plans of mice and men will simply not uh, be successful.